Good morning. Happy for you to be here today. I'm happy that God bless us with another day of life, that we could come together in this capacity, that we could open up the pages of His Word and look at some things I hope that will give you a greater understanding of God's will in your life and His love for you and His desire that you would be your, yourself part of that body and part of His life that we might bring Him glory and honor. Today we're going to continue what I began in February and Lord willing for the rest of the year we're going to be looking at the subject, the big picture of the Bible. We're going to do the next section of this lesson this morning. And I wanted to point out this morning, so you all would know, that the next time that I will be here to uh, present that will be in May. In April, well, I will not be speaking. In April, we're having a series of lessons on the book of James. So we're, they're arranging, the elders have made a little different schedule. So the next time that I'll do the next part of this will be on May the 5th. And then I will also be speaking on May the 26th to catch me up so we can catch up before I'm going to have to be gone for again in August. And I won't be able to do that because me and Craig will be in the Philippines. So uh, I'm looking at the subject of the big picture of the Bible. Looking at the Bible message from beginning to end. There is a misunderstanding that the Bible is too complicated, it's too difficult to understand, and that the message of the Bible cannot be understood but only by those who have been trained to understand it. Such thinking did not come in the mind of God. Such thinking is not correct with what the Bible states. You and I have the ability given to us by the God who created us to understand this message, and it's interwoven into every fabric of the Bible beginning in Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. And we began to look at that and gave you some background information in the first lesson. Today and for the remainder of this series, we're going to look at some of the details of the things that the Bible tells us about this God's plan, this plan of redemption, this plan of eternal redemption that God determined before the world began. Before the world began, God had a plan, and that plan had in its central focus what we focused on this morning in our singing and in, in our partaking of the Lord's Supper. That is his son. He is the key. He is the key to understanding how this plan came to fruition and how it affects each of us as we become understanding of its role in our lives. And that plan can only be found in one place, and that is the gospel of his dear son. And that can only be found in the scripture. The plan of redemption has many moving parts. And I'm not about to try, I could preach a lesson on each of these, and don't worry, I'm not going to. But the plan of redemption has to do with redemption. What is redemption? That's buying back. That means we were bought under the bondage of sin. We needed to be bought back. We have sin. That is a great enemy. That is what God's son died for. He died for the payment and the ransom payment of sin. He did it to make an atonement, to make a covering for our sin. He did it to sanctify us, to set us apart, to make us different for a different people who have a different responsibility and a different duty. And he did that through his grace. His grace was his unmerited favor that he poured out on man, not because we deserved it, not because that we demanded it, or even because that we've done anything that we would obligate him to do it. He strictly did it because he loved us. And justification was the result. What was the justification? That means to be acquitted. You and I stood guilty before God. We were guilty and doomed to a devil's hell. And God justified us. He had a plan to acquit man of his condemnation and to be able to redeem him. And the part of that is our faith. We have to have a depth of faith to understand what God did, why he did it, and accept his grace and accept his mercy and to accept the blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary that we remembered in the partaking of the fruit of the vine. It regenerated us 
Now, that's not something mystical. That's not the warm, fuzzy feeling that you feel. That's not what regeneration is. Regeneration is a new birth. It is a change. It is a something that overcomes us by us experiencing the spiritual birth as we read about in John chapter 3, but it regenerates us because now we go from being lost to being saved. We were outside, now we're inside. We were not part, now we are part. We didn't obtain mercy, now we do obtain mercy. Things have changed. We're a new creature in Christ, according to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. And we have the sacrifice of his son. That's what made it possible. Without that sacrifice, you and I would have no hope of redemption. Propitiation is a word that we don't use very much today. It means a covering. It means an atonement. It is something that God applied to our sin-stayed soul to give us redemption. And then we have his righteousness. How is his righteousness expressed? It's expressed in his word. It's expressed in the actions of what he did. And it's expressed in the love that he had for us. And the forgiveness of sin. Brethren, that is a subject that the depths of that cannot even be comprehended by mortal man. God willing to forgive. God willing to set aside my selfish action, my selfish conduct, my desire to do things that were contrary to his will and willing not only to forgive it, but to forget it, to wipe the slate clean. That is hard for us to do. But it is not hard for God to do. God did it and lovingly and willingly did it. And he did it and our response to all the things that I just went through, our response to all of that is a very simple thing. To be obedient. To express my love, my gratitude, my thanksgiving and my appreciation for what God did for me by simply being a servant, obedient to do his will. More than I can do? Too hard? I don't think so. I think I'm the benefactor. I think I got the easy part, the hard part he did, in order that I might have all these things. The gospel. Where would, well, how can I be certain? How can I know? How can I know and how can I be assured that my life is right with God? How can I be assured that I'm, in, I'm headed to where I want to go? That I'm going to receive heaven, that I'm going to be with God and with the safe through all eternity. How can I be certain? Is there a way? And the answer to that is yes. Where would you start? You want a guarantee? God gives you one. He gives us a guarantee. He gives us a promise. And you know one thing I can tell you about God? God keeps his word. I can show you so many examples of that. We could spend, I could do a series on that. and It would last a long time. Of all the promises that God's made, and all of them have one thing in, in common. He kept every one of them. And the ones that he hasn't kept, he will keep. Because that's his nature that's what he promised to do, and I know that he'll do it. And I can find all of this information in the gospel, the glad totting, the good news concerning Jesus Christ. And I can find this whole story, and I can read it, and I can revel in it, and I can come to understand it, but more than that, I can come to appreciate it in order that I will obey it. Because it means nothing if it is not obeyed. You can understand all the parts, you can appreciate it. You can be thankful for it. That's all great and good news. But it means absolutely nothing if you don't obey its precepts. Would you turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24? This is a passage that gives us an understanding of why God didn't send the Son. You know, when man sinned in the Garden of Eden and fell from what God wanted him to be, why didn't he just send the Son immediately? Why didn't he just send Jesus to the earth then and redeem Adam and Eve and set things in motion then? Well, if you really want the answer to that, you're going to have to get to heaven to ask God because he's the only one that really knows the answer to that. 
But you know, he did give another law, a law that has a great benefit, a law that you and I need to know, a law that we need to understand, but we don't live under it. But it is a law that we need to know. In Galatians 3, verse 24, the scripture says, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now what does it mean that he is our tutor? The law, the old law was our schoolmaster. It was our tutor. And what was it tutoring us to do? It was to bring us to Christ. It was to lead us step by step, point by point. It was leading us in one direction. It was setting a path. It was putting stones that led to one conclusion. In Romans, the 15th chapter in verse 4, it says, Whatever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that through patience and the comfort of the Scriptures we might have hope. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11, it says, Now these things we wrote, happened to them as our examples, and they were written for our instruction. We could also look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 14 and 15. What I want you to see is that everything that's contained in the Bible, there is a purpose. There is a reason why God put it in there. There is a reason that it's there. There's a reason why you need to know it, and there's a reason why you need to understand it. But the Old Testament was God's promise in shadow, in a copy, in an antitype that was leading us step by step to Jesus Christ. But as verse 25 says, but after faith has come, we were no longer under the tutor. If you have a map, you know, used to be, now we got GPS, greatest invention that, that's ever been made, because I, I get lost very easily. I don't get lost now. If I do, I'll blame it on the GPS. But you know, you used to make these trip logs. If you belonged to A and A, or you had a friend that did that belonged to AAA, they would give you a trip log, and they would take a map and it would take you step by step to wherever you were going, starting where you were going from home, and would lead you to wherever you were driving to or, and going to. What did you do with that trip log when you got to where you were going? Well, you probably kept it if you want to know how to get back home to go the other way. But you didn't have to do that because they'd make you another one to show you how to get back from where you were to where you were going. But you know, once you got there with the map, you wouldn't need it anymore because you've arrived at your destination. When we got to Christ, that's where God wanted us to be. That's where he wanted us to end up at. Why? Because he's the key. He's the one that unlocks the whole plan. He's the one that made it work. He's the one that would give us all those things that we read and I talked about earlier. All those things would be provided by one man in one action that that man did. And the Old Testament leads us to that conclusion. The eternal plan. In Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 3 through 6, the scripture says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to the adoptions as the sons of Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of grace, of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. Before the foundation of the world, before God said, let there be light, God had an eternal plan. And that eternal plan was going to be in Christ. Every spiritual blessing, underline that, every spiritual blessing that you and I enjoy, from salvation to forgiveness to grace, to mercy, to the hope that we have of heaven, every one of those promises and blessings can only be achieved in Christ. What does that imply? 
You and I need to be in Christ to receive the benefit of those spiritual blessings. We have free will. You can say no. You can say, I'd rather not. You can say, not yet. And man has had free will from the very beginning. Adam and Eve had a choice. They made the wrong one. We have a choice. And many times we make the wrong one. But thanks be to God, he knew that. And so he made a way that even though we would choose wrongly, even though they chose wrongly, God made a plan in order that we could still gain where we want to be. This eternal plan is called the scheme of redemption. It is God's reaction to mankind choice. Well, why did he give man free will if he was going to mess it up? That sounds logical to us, doesn't it? Why did he just make us robots and make us be able to follow him? He could have done that. He could have done that. But you know what? If he did that, wouldn't be any love. No love would be expressed. No desire for us to do that. You'd be doing it, but it really might not be what you wanted. So God was going to leave it up to you, even though he knew that man was going to make the wrong choice. It didn't mean he had to make it, but God, who knows all things, knew that he would. But God had still a way to make it right, to make it come out the way he wanted. And so why did God create man and the physical universe? The book of Job says, in Job chapter 26 and verse 14, it did these are the mere edges of his ways, and how small a whisper we hear of him, but the thunder of his power, who can understand it? Why did God create man? That's very easy to have fellowship with him. Why did he create the universe? A place for man to dwell temporarily, to give him a habitation, to give him a place in order that he would dwell and that he could be happy. But he can only be happy if he follows God's instruction. But God's going to give him free will to determine whether he wants to do that. You know, many times people talk about God and they want to know, which God are we talking about? I said, what do you mean, which God are we talking about? Oh, that God in the New Testament, he was mean. Man, he, he, he acted quickly. And sometimes God did act quickly. You know, sometimes in some ways, I wish God did that a little bit more today. Think about it. The first time man was able to offer sacrifices in the tabernacle, something that God had given him a pattern to build, and then sanctified the Levite priest to go in and offer the, the uh, sacrifices. First time they're going in with their priestly garments, in Leviticus 10, the very first time, what do they do? They changed the very thing that God said. They, changed, they offered strange fire which God did not command them. Other translations say in Leviticus 10, it was profane fire, strange fire. What difference does it make? Fire is fire. Yeah, only one little difference. God gave them instruction which to offer. They were to offer the fire that burned by the burning coals that were next to the altar. They were to get the fire from that. They got it from another source. Don't ask me where it came from. I do not know or do I care because it was wrong. And what did God do? He acted swiftly. He didn't hesitate. He sent fire from heaven and devoured them. Now, why did he do that? God was making a statement. When you come before me as a holy God to worship me, do not change anything that I tell you to do. Now, men are doing that, continually doing that today. Where's the lightning? Where's the fire? God doesn't do it that way today. Is he a different God? No. He's the same God. He just chooses to react in a different way. But it's the same God. 
And you know, Romans 11.22 teaches us that there's two sides to God. The goodness and the severity of God. Goodness, just obey Him. Just do what He says. It'll be a good thing. Severity is when you're punished. You know, when I lived at home as a young boy, my father, he was a disciplinarian. My father was very strict. And I learned very, very early in life that it would be to my benefit to do things the way he wanted. Because it went much better for me when I did that. But you know, I was, I was stubborn. I was hard-headed. My brothers benefited because they saw what happened to me. But you know, I learned very quickly. If my dad asked me if I did something, he already knew. It wouldn't do me no good to lie because he already knew. If he was asking me, he's just testing me to see if I was going to lie to him. And you know what? God knows what I'm going to do before I do it. He doesn't want me to do it if it's going to hurt me. He doesn't want me to do it if it's going to cause me pain. But he's going to let me choose just like my parents did. You know, my dad was the same all my life. Some people say he was abusive. I don't. I'm the person I am because my dad told me there were boundaries. There were things that you should do and things you shouldn't do. And there are guidelines. There are standards that you need to live by. And then he taught me those standards came from God first. And so I understood that. And so God doesn't change. He's the same God. God is holy. That's his character. That's who he is. He's holy in every manner, in every way, any way you want to look at him. He is a holy God. And he has attributes. These attributes define his character. He has, he's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's omnipresent. He can be everywhere, anywhere, at any time. These are his attributes. They are governed by his character, and his character is holy. Now, can we ever attain to that? No. No, we can't. And we're not expected to. We have limitations. We're not all-knowing. We're not all-powerful. If I was all-powerful, some of the dearest people to me on earth, they'd still be here. But I'm not all-powerful. And do I, Can I be everywhere at every time? No, if I could, then nothing would ever happen to my children or my grandchildren because I'd be right there to protect them, but I can't be. But you see, God has a different character, and these are all govern how he operates. How is it that we can pray anywhere, day, night, here, in a 13-hour time change in the Philippines, and yet we could all pray at the same time, and God hears all of us? How does he do that? I don't know. But I know he does. I don't have to understand it, folks. I just have to believe it. And I have too much evidence to doubt it. God inhabits eternity with the dominion of purity that's defined by his nature. In Job chapter 34, Job would write, Therefore, listen to me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God to do wickedness and from the Almighty to commit iniquity. For he repays man according to his work and makes man to find a reward according to his way. Surely God will never do wickedly, nor will the Almighty pervert justice. You know what that means? God's not going to make a mistake. You know, when I was growing up, there was a preacher that preached for us in Griffith, Indiana. His name was Cecil Belcher. Good man. Respected him a lot. But Brother Belcher, he had a, ha he had a habit. And he didn't like you talking when he was talking. And when I was a teenager, I used to sit there in the back. And a bunch of us sat there in the back. And if he ever caught you talking while he, uh, he was talking, he would call your name from the pulpit during the sermon. My dad had a rule. He said, Keith, if he calls your name, you just get up and you go downstairs and I'll be there directly. You know what I lived in fear in? He'd get my name mixed up with somebody else. But you know what? He never did. 
called his own son down one day, told him to get up there and sit with his mom. You know what? That made an impression on Keith. Keith's going to keep his mouth shut because I knew he'd do it. And you know what? I fear God even more than that because I know God means what he says. And so he is defined by his nature. He's not going to do wickedly. He, God's never going to give you advice that's bad. He's never going to give you counsel that's not in your best interest to do it. And he's never going to tell you that something that is not going to benefit you if you do it that way. You know why? Because it's against his nature. He wants what's best for us. He loves us. He wants us to be happy. He wants us to benefit from this life. He's not going to give you bad counsel. The bad counsel is that you disregard what he says. He's never going to do you wrong. That's why I trust him implicitly because he's never going to do me wrong. There is no hint of moral evil in his nature for you are a God who takes no pleasure in wickedness nor shall evil dwell with you. God takes no pleasure in wickedness. The Bible says in Ezekiel 33 that he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. If you think God sits up in the sky and he just relishes to be able to punish somebody and send him to a devil's hell, you know nothing about God. That is not the God that you serve nor I serve. That is not the God you read about in the Bible. Has he done that? Has he, has he put his punishment upon man? Yes, he has, but in every case, it was deserved. Because he gave them the opportunity and they did the wrong thing. My grandfather, my dad's dad, loved him a great deal. I love strawberries. I love them. He had a big strawberry patch. I used to go out there in the summer and I would pick them, clean them off with water, and then I'd eat them. He said, Keith? Wait until they're all red. Okay, okay, Grandpa, I will. One day I'm out there in the strawberry patch, picking my strawberries. Didn't know he was home. But he was home and he was on the porch. He says, hey, Keith, what are you doing? Oh, well, I'm just getting some strawberries, Grandpa. He says, come here. So I, so I go up to the house and he's got a little porch there in Cedar Lake. He goes, uh, picking strawberries, huh? Says they're red, right? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, open your hand. So I opened my hand. Three of them were red, but there was one that had a little green in it. He says, that doesn't look red. Oh, there's some red there, Grandpa. What did I tell you? He said that when they were all red, pick them. That's not all red, is it? I said, no. He said, go get me a switch. Now, was my grandfather mean, unloving, and unkind? No. He warned me, and I loved him to the day he died, and I did his funeral. And he has a lot to do with why I'm standing here before you. He was trying to teach me something. God's trying to help us. Not hurt us. He's trying to help us. But you know, people do that. They love you. They try to help you. And that's what God has tried to always do, to help us. But he can't help you if you let evil dwell within you. He still loves you. He still wants you to be his child. But you're going to have to deal with that evil. Righteousness and justice are the foundations of your throne. Love and truth go before your faith. Justice and love. We know why God loved us. We know how he expressed it in so many ways. What about this justice thing? You ever wonder why God did this sweeping under the carpet? Why didn't God just kind of let you get by with that? Now he couldn't do that. You see, no, you know why? Because he said if we sin, there's a penalty. And his justice demands that penalty be met. Does that mean he doesn't love us because he makes that justice also part of the equation? No. God's holiness is demanded in his justice for his creation. Sin has to be accounted for, folks. 
I know we don't maybe we might not like that, nor do we understand it, but it's a fact. It has to be accounted for. That's part of the equation. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice, and the earth is full of his loving kindness. Yes, justice and love work together. God's, those two parts of God's character, they work in our benefit. We like the one, we don't like the other one. But you can't have one without the other. You have to take both. You have to, you want to, great, everybody, it's easy to take his love, but you also have to come to grips with his justice. It's part of the equation. And ye shall be holy for me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from my people, that you should be mine. Because God is holy, he demands all moral uprightness in his creation. That's part of his character. That must be part of my character. It's easy for God. It's harder for me. But it's possible. It's not impossible. It just means I'm going to have to do things differently. You see, God, he desired a spiritual fellowship with us. He created us to have this fellowship with him, a fellowship with a holy God. But how does a holy God have fellowship with a sin-stained person like me? God made a remedy. God exhibits his attitude and abhors and hatred for all that is wrong. Habakkuk said in Habakkuk 1 verse 13, For you are pure eyes and to behold evil and cannot look down on wickedness. Ladies and gentlemen, the cross is the greatest, the greatest exhibition and the greatest example of love that this world has ever been shown. But in equal form, it shows his hatred for sin. For if it were not for sin, Jesus could have stayed in heaven. And if we could figure the way out of it, Jesus would have never had to endure the cross. So when you see love, there is also a hatred for sin that caused that to have to be done in order to pay the justice demanded for sin. Sin separates us from God. That's what Isaiah 59, 2 says. For your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, that he will not hear you. It's not that he's quit loving you. It's not that he no longer cares about you. It's not that he's written you off. It's that you've got to deal with this thing called sin. You can't stand between a holy God and have a spiritual fellowship with God while you remain shackled to sin. You've got to break the bondage. You've got to break this thing that separates you from your God. And that's what sin does. Sin separates us from God. It alienates us from him. It causes spiritual death. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, and you were made alive who were dead in trespasses of sin. This is how we all were. Every one of you here this morning, at some point, and maybe even now, if you are living in sin, if you have not come to the cross, then you are separated from God. Not because he doesn't love you. Not because he doesn't care about you. It's the sin that keeps you separated. And we were all in that condition. How did I get out of it? I got out of it by the remedy that God provided in his son. Sin leads to death. The wages of sin is death. That's the bad news. You know what that means? That means for my sin, what I deserve, what you deserve, is death. What Jesus got should have been me. Should have been you. Should have been every person that's ever lived on this earth. Because all of us sinned and caused Jesus' death upon the cross. You see, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short. If that was the end of the story, this would be a dark novel, wouldn't it? But I'm here to tell you in conclusion this morning, this story has a happy ending. 
because God provided a remedy. Do I wish I can un do I wish I could erase it? Do I wish I could go back and correct it? Do I wish that I could somehow make better choices than I did? Of course I do. But you know the beauty of God is he gives you a way to do that. He gives you a way to start over. He gives you a way to have a clean slate. And it doesn't matter what sin you committed. It doesn't matter how many times you committed it. It doesn't matter how long you've lived in it. Only one thing matters is what you're going to do about it now that it's facing you and you know it's separating you from God. God gave a remedy. He sent his son to pay the price of sin that all of us should have paid for our own misconduct. But he went one step further. He went away that even though we sin, we can stand justified, sanctified, acquitted, redeemed, and bought back with the blood of Jesus Christ. Not by partaking the Lord's Supper. That won't get it to you. You've got to hear the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You have to hear and you have to come in contact with this message. But you have to do more than hear it. You have to do more than read it. You have to believe it. You have to believe what it says. You have to believe what it says about Him. You have to believe what it says about what He's done and what He continues to do. You have to believe it. You have to believe all of it. If you did, we're all doomed. But you need to believe one thing. Your sin is now separating you from God. And you have a remedy that God's offering you. What does that mean? That means you have to repent. What does that repentance mean? That's the hardest part about the plan of salvation. The hardest part of the plan of salvation is repenting. Because you know what that means? That means I've got to acknowledge I'm wrong. I've got to acknowledge I'm guilty. And I've got to be willing to turn from that sin and be willing to leave it and let the blood of Christ wash it away. And then, if I'm willing to confess him, to believe what I believe in my heart, to make an outward expression of the belief and the faith that I have in God by confessing his son before men, Jesus said in Matthew 10, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. And with that confession, we make it towards salvation, according to Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. And the water that's in this baptistry behind me has no mystical power. It, it doesn't turn black. It doesn't turn red unless it's bad water. But it won't turn anything. But when you come out of it, you will be a new creature. Everything is changed. You were outside of Christ, now you're in. You were not part of the body, now you are. You were not in his church, now, that, now you are. And you were a sinner separated from God, and now you are not. Not because of the water, but because of the blood that was shed that you have access by the waters of baptism. You might not understand it, but you read Romans chapter 6, 1 through 23. You read Colossians 2, 11 through 12. You read Galatians chapter 3. It's how you put on Christ. And what did I tell you all spiritual blessings are? They are in Christ and the only way you can get in is being baptized into his death. But you know what? My brother and my sister do not make a mistake. That is not a golden pass. That that's the end of your work, for it is not. Because all that is is the beginning of a new chapter of your life. And now you must live in what you just committed yourself to. When you make the confession that you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that's not just a confession that you do one time. That is a confession that you live every day of your life. And you know how you live it? You submit to his will and you be his servant. And you be a child of his and a child loves his master by what? Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you keep his commandments. Maybe you're here and you've allowed things in the world to entangle you again. Maybe you've lost your way. Maybe you became faithful once, but you went to yourself and you went back into the world. God still loves you. We still love you. God has made another provision 
that you can come back and be forgiven. Even though you were forgiven with the blood of Christ, now the sin that you live in now, you need redemption again. But God provided a remedy. You come forward and you confess that sin, we will pray with you and for you that God will forgive you. You know what 1 John 1 verse 9 says? If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us. Ladies and gentlemen, you're never going to get a better deal than what God is offering you. What God offers you is a way out of this world alive, and you will only receive it if you follow his conditions and his terms. They are not hard. They are not difficult, but they are eternal, and they will have eternal benefit if you will obey him, and we give you that opportunity as together we stand, as we sing.